They were promised a land that flowed with milk and with honey. God's promise was this, that they could live not by the sweat of their brow, but by the blessings of their God. You see, you and I have got to understand, if we are in Christ, we ain't cursed no more. It was the result of the fall that it was decreed over man, now you shall live by the sweat of your brow. If we are in Christ, we are supposed to be living by the blessings of our God. And this is what God promised the children of Israel under the old covenant. If he could do this under the old covenant and we are partakers of a better covenant, then how much more are we supposed to be living according to the blessings of our God? Smith Wigglesworth once said that he was a million times bigger on the inside than he was on the outside. Good morning. My name is Jimmy Miller, pastor here at Real Life Church, and I welcome you to today's telecast. Today, we're going to share with you a message that I recently preached here in the sanctuary of Real Life Church entitled, You Ain't Big Enough. And, 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 and what I want to do is I really want to encourage you. I want to hold up a mirror called the Word of God and allow you to see who you really are. Because if you could ever catch a glimpse of who you are in Christ, you would never again be afraid of the devil. You would recognize and realize that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you'd be able to stare the devil down and tell him point blank, you ain't big enough to steal my dream. You ain't big enough to take my joy. You ain't big enough to kill my children. Stare them down, beat them down, run them off, because no weapon formed against you can prosper. Let's go into the telecast today. You will be blessed. You will be encouraged. You will be enlarged. We love you. We'll see you soon. How many of you have ever encountered an obstacle? You know that God has offered you promises. God has promised you a level of life, a land, if you would, a place. The psalmist called it a wealthy place. In the New Testament, we prefer to call it Christ likeness. A place where you're walking in the spirit, you're walking in power, every need is met. You are in every conceivable way like your master. If you've ever read the Gospels, you, you must recognize that Jesus never knew lack. And when he encountered lack, he had this weird ability to overcome the lack in the weirdest of ways. He would take a little boy's lunch and so manipulate the laws of physics that when they were done, instead of a little boy's lunch, they had 12 baskets full. That's just weird. When they came up against the situation where they needed some taxes, and I've heard people preach this in such a way to say, well, that's proof that Jesus was poor. Listen, you can't read that into that. How many of you ever left your house without a wallet? I have. I did it just the other day. Ran up to Walmart's to get something. Got up to the counter. Had it all there and went. And I wasn't doing the Macarena. I was looking for my wallet. I had no wallet. That doesn't mean I was destitute and homeless. It just means that at the moment I had no means by which to meet the need. When taxes were to be collected and they had no ability to pay the taxes, he turned around, and I'm going to paraphrase, he looked at Peter and he said, you're pretty good at fishing, ain't you? Peter said, well, I make my living that way. Okay, good. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go catch me a single fish, okay? When you catch the fish, dig into its mouth, and you're going to find enough gold to pay for my taxes and yours. Jesus never was victimized by his circumstances. It doesn't matter what environment he found himself in. Hear me when I say this. He was never the victim of circumstances. And that's the, the, the promises of God. By the promises of God, the Bible says we become partakers of his divine nature so that as we 
the promises are manifest and we put our faith in the promises, we come to a place that we have be partaken so much of his nature that we can say, like the Messiah said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we know the Lord has offered us many great various promises. And yet it seems in life, no matter what we do, how noble our intention, no matter how pure our motives, we do what we're told we're supposed to do. We give, we pray, we worship, we go to church, we do everything we're supposed to do. But it seems like there's always that thing standing between us and our promised land. Most of the time it's unseen, but it's not unfelt. And here's what I want to propose to you this morning to consider. That maybe that thing that is seeming to block your way is a giant positioned by the enemy to detour, stop, and if possible, destruct you. See, some people have been, and, and I, I just, some people have been blocked so often in so many ways that they have given up on ever entering in. And they put every spiritual promise and blessing off until over there. And you'll hear them say things like, well, if the Lord wanted me to have it, I'd have it. But since I ain't got it, he must not want me to have it. And in the kindest and most sincere way, can I be a little bit blunt this morning? To that statement, Brother Hagen would say, now that's just ignorance gone to seed. Meaning, that's, that's full-blown, fully manifested, fully mature ignorance. And there's something about walking with God, and I put up, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. We cannot afford to go through life ignorant. Now, we need not confuse ignorance with stupidity. Those are two different things. If someone is stupid, that means they are handicapped. They lack the ability to learn. But if somebody is ignorant, that's willful. Because that literally means they have chosen to ignore ignorance, ignore. They've chosen to ignore the realities of life and suppose something else. And that's really the case when they, when they give credit to God for something the enemy has done. And they're choosing to ignore the fact that they are being opposed and taken advantage of by the enemy. Because after all, listen, if we can choose to believe that it's God that's withholding all the, even though he's the one that promised, he's going to promise and then he's going to withhold. But if we choose to believe that God's the one doing it, I mean, who wants to fight God? Right? I mean, if God's the one withholding, if God's the one making me miserable, if God's the one keeping me poor, if God's the one making me sick, then I really don't want to fight God. And so if I assume that the enemy, according to what Paul wrote here, when he, he said that so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant here in this, he, he, he equates ignorance with being taken advantage of. The enemy finds the ignorant a perfect playground. Because he can do whatever he wants to do and tell them, it's God. He can come in and bring cancer and disease and paralysis and blindness and poverty and then go, it's only the Lord. God's the one doing this to you. Well, when we choose to quit ignoring the fact that though we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, we do wrestle. And that the enemy of life is opposing us. 
and we choose to blame him instead of God. Light comes, revelation comes, insight comes, wisdom comes. The devil loses his ability to play with us. And I don't know about you, I don't want to be the devil's play toy. I don't, want, I don't like to believe I'm anybody's fool, let alone his. This is the reason why the Bible will say different things such as study to show yourself approved. We need to know the Bible. Amen? Go to Psalm 84, verse 11. Psalms 84, verse 11. I want to read it to you out of the New Living Translation. And I've done this before with these exact same three verses. But it's okay. Because we've got to become fully convinced. We need to know the heart of our Father. Our Father is not a tormentor. To offer a promise of healing and then keep you in sickness, that's torment. To offer you the promise of provision, but then work against the own provision he provided for you, that's torment. Our God is not an inflictor. He's a deliverer. He doesn't impoverish. He provides. He doesn't keep in darkness. He brings light. Our God is a good God. Amen? Amen. David said, you are good and you do good. God's the ultimate do-gooder. And he does gooder all the time. Improper English, but you get the point. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and he gives us glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Now, let's just say this. I, go ahead, and if you're brave enough, raise your hand. How many of you are in open rebellion this morning? Go ahead, raise your hand. I ought to put mine down. <laughs> Listen, the Bible does not require of you, in order to receive provision, grace, and glory, moral perfection. What God does require of you is a committed heart. And if your heart is fully His, you may still make mistakes. But if your heart is His and you're not walking in rebellion, your mistakes are not that detrimental. All you need to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. And he is not looking. Listen, something about our father. He's not looking for reasons to withhold. He's looking for reasons to give. The Bible says his eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth looking for what? An opportunity. To show himself, to do good. He's not looking to and fro going, who can I make miserable today? No, his eyes are roaming to and fro because he so yearns to do good. So if our hearts are his, then he's not withholding. Because the Bible says he will withhold no good thing. So listen, if we are in disobedience and our disobedience is causing the Lord to need to withhold, we can fix that very quickly. I know from personal experience, it takes about a nanosecond to repent. I don't like, listen, I love drawing out worship. There are some people that have said, Pastor, if you really want to grow this church, just shorten your worship. Ain't going to happen. I love drawing out worship. I don't like drawing out repentance. With repentance, I have learned. Get it over with. <laughs> Sorry. He's that quick to forgive. Amen. I have a goal, two goals today. My first goal 
It is to so encourage you that you can look at any and every giant that opposes you and make a declaration, you ain't big enough. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? I wish that I could set up a machine to echo this through your house every day, all day, all things, all things, all things, all things, all things, all things. things. So finally it would sink through our thick heads, all things. And maybe every once in a while throw in there a word freely. (laughs) Second Corinthians chapter one, verse 20. For as many as are the promises of God, and there are many, in him, speaking of Jesus Christ, they are, yes. they are yes. In him, the Lord has not said to any promise, maybe. That's the religious that say Maybe. No, 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 no. A thousand times no. In him, God has looked at every single promise. Whether it pertains to finances, emotions, physical healing, relationships, occupation, spirituality, to every promise, God has said, yes. And Paul said our only conceivable response to all these amazing yeses is an overwhelming heartfelt amen. Amen. So be it. Lord, if it requires my prosperity to make you happy, the Lord finds pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And if it requires me, I am willing to throw myself down on the altar. I'm willing to embrace the unthinkable that maybe I can be well-resourced. But Lord, I'll only do it if it makes you happy. Well, the Bible says it will. So therefore, I'm willing. Amen? In fact, you and I ought to be willing to be anything and everything He has declared we can be. We ought to despise limitations we ought to despise boundaries that are not God ordained we ought to contend and fight for the right to obtain and to hold everything that through Christ he's given us And yet the unthinkable often happens that despite our best intentions, we find ourselves blocked. And this is the question. This is something that needs to be answered so we're not walking around in ignorance. Blaming every hindrance and obstacle and boundary on God. How are we being blocked? That deserves to be answered. And why are we being blocked? That deserves to be answered. And that's what we're going to attempt to do this morning. Amen? Now we'll get into the message. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times, and that word earlier actually means ancient times, was written for our instruction, so that through the perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, Now these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now, the reason I'm reading that to you is so that as we get into this message and we go into the Old Testament, you're not going to define Old Testament stories as to mythical stories that happened in a land long, long ago and far, far away. Because everything that happened, I have known preachers who have stated they'll never preach out of the Old Testament. 
And they'll say, well, I'm a New Testament. Well, so am I. But I think that we lose a great deal of understanding and insight if we divorce ourselves from the Old Testament, we don't get our doctrine of the Old Testament. Our doctrine is firmly established. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament, it's such a brilliant illustration. It's a visual aid of what it is to walk with God. In it, we see the epic battles of good versus evil, and we discover the schemes of how the enemy seeks to entrap and limit the people of God. And in the Old Testament, we see fully illustrated God's ability and willingness to forgive and deliver and reestablish. In it, we see the rewards of the obedient and the hardships of the disobedient. All of those stories, whether they happened to Moses, Elijah, Elisha, or David, or any of the others, they didn't happen simply as a historical record. They were written by the Holy Ghost so that when you and I read them, we would see illustrations, examples of what it means to walk in the blessings of the Lord. And so today we're going to visit the old and we're going to draw parallels and illustrations and examples so that you and I can recognize how the enemy is seeking to block us. And in describing we can define. And in defining, we can defeat. And in defeating, we can develop. You see, what you got to understand is this. When the, when the enemy sends something against you, a weapon, an entity, a demonic power, he, per, he supposes that he has the perfect plan to destruct you. But God knows that he does have the perfect plan to develop you. You see, the battles we fight, we don't fight because the enemy has a right to stand against us. The fight we fight, we fight because the Lord knows that we need to be developed. And when we defeat without, we get developed within. Is this making sense to you? In the Old Testament, we find that the people of God, much like us, they were, they were offered some tremendous promises. And in their quest to inhabit the promised land, think about these promises. Can, can we just recite a few? I'm going to do it anyhow. They were promised a land that flowed with milk and with honey. A place that they could live in houses that they didn't build. They could drink of wells that they didn't dig. And they could eat of vineyards that they didn't plant. In other words, God's promise was this. And hear this, please. God's promise was this, that they could live not by the sweat of their brow, but by the blessings of their God. You see, you and I have got to understand, if we are in Christ, we ain't cursed no more. It was the result of the fall that it was decreed over man, now you shall live by the sweat of your brow. If we are in Christ, we are supposed to be living by the blessings of our God. And this is what God promised the children of Israel under the old covenant. If he could do this under the old covenant and we are partakers of a better covenant. Yes, yes. Then how much more are we supposed to be living according to the blessings of our God? I don't know about you, but I'm through allowing limited men who have limited God to limit me. They can preach whatever they want to preach. It doesn't mean I got to listen. They can say whatever they want to say. It doesn't mean I give them airtime. Let every man, I, I, told, I'm, I was trying to be a teacher. Let every man be a liar. But my God. My God always tells the truth. 
And if he said it, I don't care what anyone else says. I'm through caring what they say. I have chosen. I've got to walk with God. When it came to the promises, there was a generation who had the promise spoken to them. But they chose to mix no faith with it. They didn't enter in. They died in the desert. But after them, there came a new generation. Generation 2.0. This generation made a decision, and I choose to identify with that generation. I like Caleb. I like someone who says, I don't care if I'm 80. Give me my mountain. We are well able. I don't care how I've been handicapped. I don't care if I got big hair, no hair, blue hair, green hair. I don't care my skin color. I don't care my age. I don't care my gender. If God be for me, it doesn't matter who's against me and I'm able to take my mountain. There was a generation that said, we ain't going to do what they did. They did what they did. We're going to live by faith. Now, what you need to understand is the generation that chose not to live by faith, they never needed face the giants. It's the generation that said we're able. It's the generation that said we will. It's the generation that said we will walk by faith and not by sight. We will be that generation that inhabits this place. We will be the generation that, that, that makes our decisions based upon what God has said. We will be the generation to live in that land. They are the ones that had to face the giants. For those of us who have chosen to live by faith, we're gonna come up against some things. But we're gonna come up against them knowing who the devil is and who God is. And we ain't never gonna confuse the two. How, do, how, how, how can you tell the difference? I have this thing inside me. It's not a thing, it's a person. He's called the Holy Ghost. I have the Word of God and all I've got to do is get into it. And in this, I discover the characteristics of my Father. And in this, I discover the characteristics of the fallen one. And I've learned if it walks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it's a duck. I don't have to confuse the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. Thank you for watching today. If you were blessed by today's message and would like to hear more, we would like to offer you a free audio CD of this message in its entirety. Just contact us here at Real Life Church using the information that's on your screen. Ask for your free copy of today's message. This is our gift to you. We know that you will be blessed. Be sure to get this month's special offer. For a donation of any amount, Pastor Mello would like you to receive his book, The ABCs of Dream Development. It has touched many lives, and I know that it will bless you. We would like to invite you to come and worship with us this Sunday at Real Life Church. Worship begins at 10.30 a.m. We are located at 5080 Sandy Flat Road in Taylors in the old sanctuary of the Faith Temple Campus. Come and see how God is moving and be a part of something special. We hope to see you there.